part of the public consultations for India's Science, Technology and Innovation Policy 2020. Very glad to have our eminent panelists, interested viewers, and the spirited team behind this unique initiative. This is Sudhira from Gubi Labs, and I'll be the moderator of today's session along with Dr. Soumya Patak from the DST uh, STIP 2020 Secretariat. Um, the discussion today is divided into two rounds, and in the first 45 minutes or so, we'll be hearing from our panelists on the relevance of the theme in the context of STIP 2020, followed by a round of question and answers coming from the general public watching live streaming, live streaming today. The event is live streamed on YouTube, and uh, we encourage the users or audience to use the hashtag ask stick 2020 human resources to pose your questions. We have a dedicated team looking at uh, the questions that may be coming from all the different social media platforms on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn. Uh, we encourage you to please post your uh, questions with this hashtag ask stick 2020 human resources. Thank you once again, all for uh, all for joining us this uh, evening. I'll now take this opportunity to introduce our panelists for this session. Uh, to start with, we have Professor Pankaj Jalote. He has been a he's a distinguished uh, professor and also the former and founding director of IIIT Delhi. He was also the Microsoft Chair Professor at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering at IIT Delhi. Prior to which, he was also a faculty at the Kanpur. Uh, welcome you. Uh, uh, I welcome you, Professor Jalote. Our next panelist is Dr. Shakila Shamshu, formerly the Officer on Special Duty, for, uh, who looked after the drafting of national policy with the Department of Higher Education in the Ministry of Human Resource Development. She is also the Secretary to, uh, the, to draft national education policy now, and she also does research in higher education on teacher education, digital learning technologies, and education policy. We welcome you, ma'am. Uh, next, I invite my co-moderator, Soumya, to introduce and welcome the remaining panelists. Over to you, Soumya. Thanks a lot, Sudhira. I am extremely elated to introduce the rest of the panelists of today's discussion. And a uh, very warm welcome to all. We have with us uh, Professor Pratibha Jolly, uh, former principal, Mirinda House, University of Delhi. Uh, currently, she is an academic consultant with the National Assessment and Accreditation Council, which is NAC. Uh, she headed Mirinda House. Uh, University of Delhi and her, in her leadership, the college remained as the topmost college over the last 10 years in an IR of ranking. A very warm welcome, Professor Jodhi. And I am very delighted to introduce uh, Dr. Roop Manjari Ghosh, uh, Vice Chancellor of Shiv Nadar University, Uttar Pradesh. She is also the former director of School of Natural Sciences and Dean of Research and Graduate Studies at Shiv Nadar University and a professor of physics and former dean at the School of Physical Sciences at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Uh, she has contributed to science research and training from the university to school level. She has also served as a chief advisor for the National Council of Education Research and Training, NCRT, uh, for science textbook for class 9 and 10. It developed a fresh under uh, National Curriculum Framework 2005. A very warm welcome, uh, Dr. Roop Manjari Ghosh. Uh, so, uh, in the continuation, our next panelist, uh, the uh, biophysicist of uh, <laughs> India, means uh, Professor Gautam Menon, Ashoka University, Asonipat, India. Professor, uh, uh, for Professor of Physics and Biology at Ashoka University. Prior to joining Ashoka, he was a professor with theoretical physics and computational biology groups at the Institute of Mathematical Sciences, Chennai. Uh, where he was the founding director, uh, founding dean, sorry, founding dean of computational biology group. He is currently an adjunct professor in the Department of uh, Biological Sciences at Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Mumbai, India. A very warm welcome, Professor Menon, and uh, we are very delighted to welcome you all. Uh, with that said, I would like to invite our audience to ask questions as comments on YouTube and those on Twitter and Facebook. Uh, please ask your question with hashtag ask step 2020 human resource. If possible, please mention your name and please. We will try to bring them, uh, them up to our speaker today. Uh, for audience as a public, uh, your voice is very much needed in our ongoing dialogue for designing nation's fifth science technology and innovation policy. So a very warm welcome to you audience also. Uh, so uh, I invite uh, Dr. Shagun Bhasha uh, from Office of PSA, Government of India, 
for briefing about this activity. So uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Shagun. Thank you. Thank you, Saumya. Thanks, Sudhira, for uh, setting the stage. Uh, I, I really feel privileged that we have this stellar panel today for our public uh, panel series. Uh, and, and the topic of today's discussion is also one of the most important topic that uh, we have it in our track two uh, policy uh, drafting process, as well as we wanted to have it uh, in the track one so that we have a larger engagement. Uh, the, the, the range of uh, range of expertise that is there in this panel is is something very remarkable. That's that's a remark that uh, others also made. Uh, I personally thank Professor Jalote, Professor Jolly, uh, Dr. Shakila Shamshu, Professor Ghosh, and Professor Gautam Menon that they could take time and contribute to this process, and and it makes it really really inclusive and, and interesting for all of us. And we all feel privileged to to work and engage with all of you in this very important exercise of national importance. With that, I I I'm here to just to just to connect. What is the significance of having this thematic public panel? Um, like many of you already know that uh, the drafting process for this policy has started some time back and, and the track is going, the drafting process as a track is going in 21 different groups uh, parallelly and that has come to uh, a first round of uh, conclusions very recently. Uh, the reason of these thematic panels is to connect the larger voices, not only, uh, not only general uh, audience or public, but also extended extended uh, expert pool uh, that we could not really engage with in the closed group conversations in the track two to engage here and to and to feed in their ideas thoughts and questions uh, in this policy process through this discussion also very importantly these thematic public panels help us bring out what kind of ideas are being discussed in this drafting process that kind of starts uh, the, the public discussion on these policy areas that will feed into our policy process. The bottom line is to make this policy as participatory as possible so that we, we get to have a, an inclusive and an all around uh, driven policy from the bottom up approach. With that, I'll hand over to the moderator, uh, Dr. Saumia, to conduct this session. Thanks so much. Over to you, Saumia. Thank you, uh, thank you so much, Shagun. Uh, I'm extremely excited to start the discussion session with our esteemed panelists who have joined us this evening. Since most of the panelists uh, are part of our track two process, and I was also associated with them since last one month. So a very warm welcome again to you all. Uh, so to begin with our discussion on skill human resources and capacity development, which has been one of the most important sectors in STI policy making, which aims to empower people in terms of knowledge and skill that will support them as a lifelong learners to participate and contribute to the global world. So I think there's a need of uh, creating a qualification corridor for them that will go a long way uh, in establishing and recognizing qualification and skill beyond the employability. So in this context, we look forward to getting insight from our expert on how the upcoming STI policy can uh, help leverage science, technology, and innovation to enable accessible, and affordable education uh, in the terms of higher education, higher education institutions, skill uh, education, vocational education systems, and uh, as well as for PhDs also uh, for capacity development for the nation. Uh, so uh, to start with, I would like to request uh, Professor Jalote to share his thought uh, on this. Uh, uh, so over to you, uh, Professor Jalote. Yeah. Okay, yeah. got it. So you said we uh, uh, we have about I have about four minutes, right? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, delighted to be here. Uh, I will focus just on one point, which also I had mentioned, uh, namely on research manpower. So research, just just to get going, research is a quest for creating new knowledge which is different from innovation, which is different from the kind of research projects that students do, which is sort of researching on old knowledge, uh, but creating a report. So research is a quest for new knowledge, and researchers are generally, simply because it's very, very competitive and very hard now to sort of even know what is new and not, you need to be on top of uh, what is the old knowledge. Researchers are generally those who are trained in the in the uh, methods of research, 
namely PhD. That's now by and large uh, uh, broadly accepted. So my contention is that high quality PhDs, uh, or rather I strongly believe that high quality PhDs in large numbers is the foundation for pretty much all we do in education and innovation spaces. So I think this is, this is the manpower, that is the research manpower produced through the PhD training. It powers the education system. I'll explain a little bit more in a moment. It powers the R&D labs of our companies and, and, uh, and various government labs. And actually, if we see, research is also in many ways foundational to innovation, though, of course, innovation can take place without research as well. Okay. So if you see, ed education system is really like a pyramid. Uh, at the top are usually research universities. And then you have, and in fact, our NEP has this time actually proposed it as a pyramid. Uh, so top you have research universities. Then you have universities which are very well, uh, you know, which have some research, but are really largely education oriented. And then at the bottom, you may have colleges, which are really largely education focused. So it's a paradigm of good quality education. If you really want to do high quality education in all universities, if you don't have faculty members engaged in research, you're not going to get high quality education. So in education, those subject matters where the body of knowledge is fairly static and established, uh, you know, a person with scholarship can, can teach, but where the body of knowledge is fluid and evolving, uh, you know, you would, uh, the, the researcher, a person with research background is likely to be better at teaching that course. So you can teach some foundational courses where the body of knowledge is established, by people who may not be engaged in research, but the moment you come to advanced courses, which all higher education degrees should have, you need to have research degrees. So what, what you want in a higher education system is that PhD graduates from the top layer, that is the research universities, go and not only provide faculty to the research universities, but also faculty to the next layer. And this next layer produces, as well as the first layer, produces and provides faculty to the bottom layer, to the third layer, that is the college. If you see the tragedy of our education system is that we are unable to take from a higher layer and we end up taking faculty from the same layer to become faculty in that. So in some sense, this, this creates, creates stratification between them, so colleges, there is little collaboration with universities. They don't know much about it. The teaching oriented universities don't do much with research universities. So, so, so this is, this is a, almost a sort of natural paradigm. You want the teacher to be higher coming from an educational institute that is higher than your own educational institute. And because our research universities are fewer in number, the number of PhDs graduating from them is not substantially large, plus various other aspects at the lower level, uh, that principle, which I think is a sound principle, gets violated. So I think to end it, my time is also getting over, uh, we really need large number of high quality PhDs. And that can only happen if there is a substantial number of good quality, global quality research universities number one, say 100 plus, and that's, that's what NEP also envisions, and bulk of the PhDs are coming out from research universities. PhDs is not like bachelor's degrees which can cut across. It should be, one is not saying that only there, but bulk of the PhDs should be coming out from there. If we can do that, then we will see that, uh, that, that, uh, the quality of all the education program and the other uh, areas that depend on research will start improving. Thank you. Thank you so much, Prof. Jalute, for putting things in the, in the perspective and giving us very nice recommendations for PhD training, research universities, 
and how we need the excellence in phd training research university quality education to develop skill human resources and therefore and then for capacity development and i am really very excited to invite uh, our next panelist to share uh, her views on these topic uh, for, because these are the very uh, crucial points so next i would request uh, dr shakila to kindly share your thoughts from your wider experience regarding the uplifting scenario of upskilling uh, human resources and also you are secretary in making of national education policy uh, of the country so your views will be really very helpful so over to you uh, dr shakila yeah thank you dr somia uh, i hope i'm audible i uh, yes yes you are yeah. audible perfect yeah i think um, there's no better time in which the national education policy and the science technology and innovation policy is coming uh, is being brought out by the government uh, at a time when i think we have been talking about this huge demographic advantage that we have it's another issue that we are going through a pandemic and therefore many of the expected developments may have taken gone on a little bit of a back burner but i think the fact remains that we are trying to leverage the youth power to sort of be globally competitive and to be globally competitive you just can't think of just an education system uh, which is there to provide massified education but provide something that is cutting edge in nature and if it has got to be cutting edge in nature then it can't be the run of the mill education that you tend to provide uh, while it is true that you know education remains an aspirational goal and every child has an aspiration to achieve or to complete education we need to cater to that demand also because that's the largest number so we move out with ger targets uh, all nations try to achieve quantitatively a number of targets because we want to say there will be this many million of children who will be there in the higher education system this should be the transition rate from the secondary level to the higher education system these are all targets that any nation would set for itself as part of its developmental growth but what is important for us at this stage is to say that india is now already there as a developed nation and it has proven itself today in the global committee of nations as having achieved a certain degree of educational indices in terms of quality has achieved a certain degree of economic growth it has proven its technological prowess by going into the areas of space technology and so on so we are i mean there we are already there now the question is can we marry education science technology and innovation in a harmonious manner by which we are able to empower and equip our children our students and our teachers in trying to bring out the best in them in developing a scientific temper in trying to have what we call as the 21st century skills and like professor jellote mentioned unfortunately the higher education system today is so much silo based so much discipline based and does not encourage a spirit of inquiry it is very difficult to think of a student who actually has a very innovative spirit to make a mark over there because you are actually preventing that you are actually putting all of them to become like robots whereas you need to actually break and allow them to think out of the box so like without having i mean there is no other way in which i can put it but when we were discussing the national education policy we actually were trying to first understand what are those challenges that we have to overcome those challenges what can we recommend and the silo based approach and the discipline specific approach that we have starting from our school education system in onwards where we categorize them as arts science commerce engineering medicine pharmacy without trying to think of a liberal arts approach and we are saying that a individual has to have a holistic comprehensive development i should be able to appreciate the arts as much as understand the scientific developments as well as appreciate maybe a particular language 
also a particular kind of physical sciences that may be happening uh, technological changes that may be happening so as a young adult of let us say 18 plus where you are having a brain where you are able to assimilate a lot of things that are happening and not just look at you know education from a very narrow perspective and give a broad perspective we thought of having having class education or holistic education uh, the terminology of liberal arts is not very acceptable but at least comprehensive holistic education where you are empowering and equipping students to appreciate knowledge of all kinds which may be pure sciences which may be social sciences it can be humanities it can be vocational education it can be performing arts it can be uh, many other things that go on to make up what we are referring to and the ancient indian system as 64 kalas that go to make a complete human being and this is what we want higher education systems to develop we want our students to be able to appreciate to understand the knowledge in all these different areas and then choose what could be their area of specialization ultimately like professor jalote say as you go up towards your research area you will have to narrow it down to a very focal area into your focal area you cannot afford to sort of take a very uh, you know a very um, um, have a macro level approach and then go on to zooming into a specialized area so that you are able to go in for immersive research. So one of the things that I would feel that the interplay between science, technology, innovation and the education systems are that we have a lot of labs that are there created by the departments of science and technology. We have our higher education institutions there that are there. We have the industry that is there and it's own requirements and the economy which is there now overlaying all that is the technology that is happening and i think we need to actually bring, build about bringing about a coordinated effort between all these existing uh, you know strengths that we have institutional strengths that we have we don't have to really go about creating something new but these institutional strengths that are there can we make them more focused towards bringing about a multidisciplinary approach where we are able to actually encourage science and technological thinking in our children and help them to become innovative. So now the Ministry of Human Resource Development does a lot of hackathons only with the idea and hackathons at a very young age because the creativity in the child is ignited much, much earlier. We are actually getting products who are coming to us who are already 17 year olds. And unless you ignite that at a very young age, and then you develop on it as they come into higher education, you can't really think of innovation just coming like that out of the box. It has to be something that needs to be nurtured. And therefore, I would feel that the HEIs, the science and technology departments, the uh, industry, the society as a large, because we have ethical issues, and the global committee in terms of the sustainable development, we need to look at all these as if they are all to there for a common goal of actually enhancing the quality of life and at the same time be competitive because you have to encourage competition. Without competition, you will not be able to actually, you know, have a winning streak. You must encourage that. And whereas we have not really been built on the competitiveness of our children at all. We must encourage that so that we are able to actually stretch our limits. I think all of this together is, I, I, I am really feeling blessed to be part of both the NEP and the STIP to actually see that the government is looking at in a very coordinated manner at trying to take forward for the youth of the country. Ultimately, it is the youth and we need to make them globally uh, they must be global citizens and we should be able to prove their, we should be able to empower them. And the only point that I would like to mention on the faculty is that we have unfortunately found only one person to blame for the all the uh, flaws in our education system and that is the teacher whom you are willing to hang by the nose. 
whereas the teacher has not had a system that has been very supportive. One is the teacher needs to be constantly upgraded and given the freedom to be constantly upgraded. You will have, I have principals and vice chancellors on this panel, there are institutions which prevent their faculty from going in for many of these conferences, many are participating in all of these. How do you allow them to have a global exposure unless you allow this kind of, you know, an ecosystem which allows uh, the faculty to grow? So we need to look at skilled human resources from the student's point of view and from the teachers as both being the major stakeholders if we have to really achieve a better quality of skilled human uh, manpower within this country. Sorry for using a outdated terminology of manpower, but the, uh, the human potential and the human power is the most, most critical. And I think, uh, we, I think through all these discussions and the policies, we'll be able to achieve uh, that goal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Thank you so Shino, much, Dr. Uh, for amazing things regarding the ecosystem of holistic education and about the youth power for providing cutting edge research and thinking towards marry education and SNT with all the stakeholders of education to enhance the quality of life. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, taking this forward, I would request Dr. Ghosh to kindly share her thought on this uh, from her wide experience in the education system as a means of changing the stakeholders. All right. Over to you, uh, Dr. Ghosh. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Okay. So thank you very much for organizing this, first of all, and for including me. Uh, the, uh, the fantastic views from the first two speakers. So since time is limited, and I uh, normally on this topic, you know, all of us have a lot to say because you're living this, you're living this challenge. So I'll just put some points across and later, if time permits, we'll elaborate on them. So uh, first, today, I think, Nobody going by the way we are doing this, uh, you know, discussion uh, in the remote way. Nobody can forget the context. So let me just start with that. Everybody is talking about a new normal. I don't think it's nothing, anything new, but uh, we need to respond to this uh, volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. And I think we should respond with our vision, understanding, clarity, and agility. So VUCA with VUCA. And uh, what I am talking about is no knee-jerk reactions because this is giving us a lot of learning the current crisis and i'm going to touch upon that a bit so uh, why does leadership of the matter in this times of crisis because in my view it's to maintain perspective in a crisis and i think that's what you're trying to do and let me also qualify uh, why we are here though you don't need that qualification from me but the qualifying remark is that when you're talking about a policy we are not talking about uh, organic growth organic natural growth you're talking about a collective wisdom as an intervention to the natural growth process. And that's why you need a policy. And I think we need to be very, very conscious of that. And uh, I also believe in my various administrative capacities in institutional memory, because and I'm going to harp on that because sometimes I start by looking at the end and then I walk backwards to figure out the starting point. So end of a policy period, if you put in some report card system, how would you judge the success of your policy? And the institutional memory I'm talking about is that India did have science and technology. And last one, I think 2013, the innovation policy, innovation word was added. And I think there's a lot of learning from where we did well, where we actually didn't do anything. And I think unless we take that into account, this is a very, very ambitious project that you guys are leading right now. We'll be falling in the same trap. So I think I'll focus on the end to start because the journey is equally important, not just the end product. So I think that's something I want to mention. So perspective, leadership, leadership with competence and leaders are useless if you don't have resources. So essentially it's all coming to that competent leadership with perspective and resources. And I'm talking about a report card in the end and no knee jerk reactions because it's kind of, I'm going to argue that this is what this sector is all about. We are not talking about the primary education. We're talking about higher education. It's a very privileged sector and excellence is everything that gets defined in here. So uh, yesterday's pre-COVID context was Industry 4.0, and we had many discussions on that. The current trend in automation and data exchange in manufacturing technologies that includes cyber physical systems, you know, it, it was very disruptive to the education sector. 
and it was disruptive i argue because it, education sector was lagging so if you continuously are a lagging education sector to technology then it would feel like disruption disruption is a fashionable word today for for every researcher like pankaj so beautifully put forward uh, disruption is your key without disruption there is no new knowledge cre creation so we are sort of we are quite used to disruption but it should not be a, a negative one altogether if we only if you do not have the strength to absorb the positivity is coming out of a good crisis you see so that's point i want to be in the context of our stip uh, today so uh, i i feel that in the new india like before university education should drive and not just respond to industry or technology so uh, we need competent leadership and resources to enable this sector now what kind of questions like shakila rightly pointed out and we have debated even in fiki a lot you know i co-chaired the higher education committee there the future of work was if i simplify the questions was will an algorithm take your job what are humans feel good for right so if a uh, higher education system i have talked about it 3 4 years back a lot that the goal is machines are taking over human jobs not just road jobs but thinking jobs because of ai then higher education systems end product cannot be to produce machines like that so what are humans still good for if humans have an edge over machines in creativity because we can connect our left brain to the right brain so the visual intuitive part to the algorithmic part algorithmic and logical part which can be coded by the computer but the intuitive part is still not being coded so we'll see how far it goes but uh, so social intelligence creativity and all of these uh, we are far from being fully automated so humans have an edge so in some way to win the battle of future of work uh, we need to put our education system on that track okay so there brings my third point which is i strongly believe and i have passionately argued about have been arguing about it skilling cannot be taken totally outside the higher education system because if you skill my students in one job today they will be out of job tomorrow because jobs are vanishing from the market so only skill that doesn't get outdated is the skill of critical thinking the skill of creative problem solving and also of communication and decision making so i think ultimately it's not what to think but how to think but not that cliched way but if you are good in something you can be unlearning and being becoming good in something else and so it's extremely important that we train our students in multidisciplinary tools kind of holistic training not in silos but there is no fight between breadth versus depth you have to have a, a t shaped uh, you know education system where the uh, the the t the the can be actually moved around depending on what the market demands today and if you are no good at anything you will not be any good of that so you know there is there, this is the fourth point that i want to make is of course i talked about leadership leadership has to be by example we have a lot of people in this country that talk a lot but they have never done it in their life and i think our students are desperately looking for mentors and role models you know so leadership by example from wherever it comes and you know in uh, some way this country has many layers all of us know that 17th century coexist with 21st century and i think we cannot apply one design to fit all and i think this is certain advantages of having such a complex system but we need to address that and uh, this is a, a really big problem because you know technology can give you some solutions but it social problems are much deeper than that and technology has to function within social systems so we need to actually have a system which is not a copy from anywhere else it has to be totally indian highly contextual while we are a global looking uh, forward looking economy today uh, in that the fifth point i want to make is imagination is more important than knowledge right and that probably you know i don't want to get into the semantics but you know research leads to what i call inventions generation of knowledge leading to inventions and that's irrespective of market what the market demands what the industry demands uh, today the word innovation is uh, you know the mother of that is probably commercialization so that's really linked to the market and we need to be cognizant of these various terms which one floats where so i want to make a very strong point in here that because that was one of the questions that you shared with us somya that if you look at history 
innovation does not come just from giving people incentives it comes from creating environments where their ideas can connect it's a quote from steven johnson i probably restated it but roughly that, that's what it has come from and so the teaching learning process has to be research and innovation driven there has to be strong equitable and credible partnerships national and international academic and industrial public and private in this i need a policy intervention because i think our partnerships need that care of the government to sort of make it flourish it's not organically growing you know you can say that i should uh, you know send 200% of my students for internship the industry is not capable of doing the kind of r&d our students need training in so i'm sending them abroad what for how is the country gaining so i think we need to really have a strong policy intervention in supporting strong equitable credible partnerships partnerships cannot happen on charity it has to be on mutual strengths so higher education system has to come up to a certain uh, level industry r&d has to come up with a certain level on complementary mutual strengths uh, credible partnerships will develop and i really strongly urge the government to take this this point into account and also how to facilitate international partnership post covid uh, the situation will change so this is going to be an everyone winning win win situation and i think we need to keep that in mind funding is extremely important appropriate funding to advance scientific and technological research and education studies that the impact of science and technology upon its citizens and uh, regulations as prescribed if necessary so uh, the last point i want to make is that uh, some of the top scientists technologists and ceos of the world have been beneficiaries of our science and policy ecosystem right whether you did it purposely or not but you know there are indians everywhere and so i think it would be good to decode what worked and how do i measure science technology and innovation this is a big debate and i think india can have its own system which is growing through an irf and uh, the stuff innovation we have not done much on and i have some ideas and we can talk about that so the success of the policy will depend on a good measure of science technology and innovation the way we wish to do it's it's a little bit of uh, you know mix of what pankaj said i i do i'm separating out uh the quest for new knowledge which is in respect of the market research excellence and invention i'm separating that out to innovation leading to commercialization which is for public good and i think we need a healthy mix keeping in mind the complexity of the different layers in our system so uh, the term innovation is the key so uh the last point i want to make is that uh the seeding science and technology based innovation is a really often highly risky so the risk how do you you know actually support and actually uh, promote the culture of high risk innovation in this country we are so much status quo based we don't want to take risk and that's why in the curriculum it gets reflected right you don't ask questions you just are comfortable doing what you know would be a sure sort success and your definition of success is just pass fail marks etc so that's a you know trajectory that's well defined so how do i promote high risk and we should debate on that how do i promote high risk innovation and there is a trajectory for that too it's not so uh, unknown and in last comment in you know, a half a comment is uh, we should the policy cannot be so closed though i'm talking about a report card but policy i'm not advocating a closed policy because what covid had shown us which we knew already that in a time of rapid change and high uncertainty a responsible policy making requires preparing for new and unexpected developments so high risk and unexpected is the openness i want in this policy not to have a very closed outlook but something that would open up for the new india of our dreams so i'll stop here and be happy to take up some questions later thank you very much thank you so much dr roosh thank you so much for giving us a thought provoking ideas and a detailed insight into landscape uh, for leadership and perspective towards new demand of education and uh, about perspective towards uh, skilling uh, students and developing indigenous systems uh, as uh, you said ki uh, inventions is needed with innovation so we need to establish ideas first as per today's scenario these are very important points and we are getting a very uh, nice perspective from all of you regarding the sti policy uh, in various domain of education so uh, taking this forward i would request professor uh, uh, pratibha to kindly share her thoughts on this 
from her wide experience in education system, uh, especially uh, uh, from the base of education system. So uh, over to you, uh, Dr. Pratibha. Thank you so much, Soumya. And uh, uh, thanks also to the earlier speakers and everyone comes from their own perspective. Uh, I must say that uh, I will take uh, Rupa's uh, um, uh, analogy a little further. And that is that I don't look at education as just you know a set of blocks that can give given any particular shape you know uh, and so on it is a living organism and when you look at the schools and you look at the colleges 40000 of them across geographies and look at the demographic profile of our country yeah. you know the backbone happens to be exactly this sector and this is uh, where um, you need to focus, you need to focus early, and you need to focus uh, on uh, the new generation that is coming up. And uh, from here, you will have the talent that will go on to create a research ecosystem or innovations. Because it cannot happen that, you know, you look at the top first and then you hope that uh, what you produce there will percolate down. I mean, that's not going to happen. So the uh, reality of our country is where we stand today. And now to make transformations, uh, you always have to have a continuum on which transformations will take place. And my experience shows that incrementally, brick by brick, project by project, I made certain changes and I never realized when I look back that they were disruptive. And the amount of talent in motion that has emerged from our schools and colleges needs to be respected. And uh, they show the way actually. So let me also speak very quickly about the demographics because we need to remind ourselves of, uh, that. You know, it's counterintuitive. Today, India and its young are aspirational. And they are, uh, those who are now entered uh, higher education, they are to internet born, they are born to this century. They are the digital, uh, 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 you know, digital generation. They're very, very savvy, and whatever be the remote area of the country, because of the diffusion of, uh, uh, let, let us say, information systems, if not knowledge systems, they're aware, and they're aspiring. And on their own merit, they're able to make it to the top universities or metro cities in search for uh, uh, better opportunities. And uh, I call this the moonshot generation. And we have to understand that, you know, Formal systems, non-formal systems, we can plan to overhaul the entire education system, but we need to respect the aspiration and the talent, the native talent, the smartness of this generation that is overcoming challenges. Uh, they can be social cultural, they can be economic, and they're coming in. Therefore, it is a moral imperative that we who are in a formal uh, privileged education system should break the silos completely, look at the holistic organic evolution, we owe it to this population to give our very best. And if you have to build the bridges between schools and colleges, colleges and then better known colleges or what you call as elite research institutions, so be it. It has to be really a, 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 you know, an organic growth where everybody is handholding everybody else, whether it be the employment sector or um, it be our R&D. Uh, because where is the uh, conduit for talent coming from? It begins from the schools. And if you look at ISRO, you look at atomic energy institutions, you look at even, let us say, the premier IITs and so on, who are the teachers there? They have come in from smaller cities, smaller institutions, and on their own merit, let me call this entire uh, cohort as a moonshot generation, you know, and look at how our own students are capable of doing so much more. So that said, uh, we need to create therefore a system that does not disappoint our young, because they are knowledgeable, they are learning from peers, they're learning from social media, and uh, we cannot judge them from the kind of tools and techniques that our generation use to learn. So there are these social theories of learning, you know, so education has to be hands-on, it has to be minds-on, it has to be hearts-on. And we have to create these kind of institutions and uh, 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 certainly the traditional system do not work because uh, those who are masters at hacking the game will hack it. 
So if you are going to give the same kind of uh, you know, examination system and teachers are going to teach to the exam, why should the student who's smart enough not hack that system and score 100 on 100 to proceed further? So they'll have to have two lives. One is to keep their head above the water so that they can make it to these institutions. And the other life is that they have to have their own talent, their own aspirations, and their own uh, ways of learning also being further. So uh, our uh, moral imperative, therefore, is to respond to the times and not be fossilized. Educational systems are very much fossilized. But I must say that you know, uh, many times, we judge institutions based on our own experience 10, 20, 30 years back. But you have to go into the country. You have to travel. You have to see how the vocabulary of institutions is changing because they're internet connected. They are looking at things now with assessment accreditation, quality framework and quality assurance is at least a term in the vocabulary. People are looking at what are the new pedagogies. The other thing that has changed is, and the pandemic has very clearly shown us, is that interconnectedness is the only thing that is required today for survival. Look at how our supply chains have functioned, agricultural education that has never been mainstream, how those farmers who have not even been educated, the gig economy has kept us afloat, and we in our air-conditioned rooms have had the privilege of going on to platforms, digital platforms, and learning from the very best. But have we ever stopped to think the native intelligence of those in the gig economy or those uh, running a Ola, Uber, and so on, how smartly they have, you know, they have been able to get into the digital platform even without formal education. So we need to, one, redefine education, two, consider ourselves as an organic, holistic system. Unless we look at us as a holistic ecosystem, break the silos, how do we aim to break the silos of disciplinary domains and talk of interdisciplinarity? How do we talk about community engagement? How we, do we talk about education being related to the world of work and uh, for the benefit of the country to cater you know, to aspirations of communities, which are really very high today? And how do we therefore build a nation that will be in the top league? So we have to take everybody together, and that is important. So what is very, very important is that we build the bridges. And therefore, as has been said, you have to begin early and recognize that even a small child has immense uh, uh, creativity and has theories of the world, which, however, differ from the theories of an expert and as they are presented in the classroom. And when this is a mismatch, you know, research also shows that teachers have to find ways in which they can convert a novice learner to an expert learner. And hands-on activities in STEM disciplines have not had the due uh, place. So infrastructure becomes in important. Uh, teachers' training becomes very important. Active learning uh, should not be rhetoric, but they are very smart. I mean, there are ways in which this can be trained, and it is so exciting. So I always look at, and it has worked in my own case, when we talk of leading from the front, first be the student. So I've always considered myself as a student. I've loved to learn. I have, uh, you know, sort of uh, made a career out of project-based learning and working with young students and uh, um, you know, that apprenticeship model, be it in learning of crafts, experimental skill, or cognitive apprenticeship that will also take you to blue sky research, building of quantum computers, or, you know, I mean, today, life science is the new horizon, or uh, creating all these wonderful platforms on which uh, other things can be built, even educational resources can be built. You begin early. Because it is only a ignited mind and uh, uh, that is going to be able to do that blue sky uh, research at the top of the, uh, you know, whatever you call it, um, um, in those research institutions. And uh, we have to be able to evaluate for all the funding that goes in what happens. So I do think that opening up both formal and non-formal ways of learning understanding how we always will have to relate it to the world of work is important. So many times now we're thinking, talking about training, vocationalization, skills, and so on, you know. The competencies framework is important. 
But what is far more important is that the time is now right for us to create a national policy on enterprise education. And this has to be an integral part of the schools. Design thinking has to be an integral part of schools. Agile thinking has to be an integral part from early enough so that we are able to, uh, you know, sort of not have too much of baggage, but be able to be very, very creative, whatever it takes, whatever it takes on the ground, involves students in building educational resources. Have teachers co-develop educational resources because the user must be a part of the development process because that is where the best part of the training will happen. Co-mingle the role of education researcher and uh, a practitioner teacher and a researcher and have actually the teams of students and teachers and uh, undertake projects, community projects, you know, sustainable development goals have to be taken in and the young are doing it. Today, uh, we need to learn from this new generation. Just look at the immense amount of contextualized innovation that is coming out from the very young. So with that, let me simply say that we are an education ecosystem is a living, thriving uh, organism. It has a mind of its own. It takes a direction of its own. We have to give it coherence through policies. We have to empower it through our policies and that is very, very important. And we have to understand that we have to make room for the moonshot generation, be it in schools, be it a three-year-old who is now going on to become the youngest robot maker or eight-year-old who's a TED speaker or a 16-year-old who is designing uh, artificial intelligence empowered, uh, let's say surgery platforms, which are being adopted in hospitals and so on, or whatever it be. So let us build those bridges across and look at how, as a community, as a country, we can move together and obviously in a formal system, take the best practices to give a thriving uh, you know, system. And let's say education will always be the heartbeat of the country. All young are the ones for which educational institutions have to work because it is so exciting to work with an aspirational young student. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pratibha, for your views regarding demographic, uh, demographic profile of our country, research ecosystem of country, incremental transformation in education, and from school to college, a holistic organic growth in the education system and their interconnectedness. So, and we, we, re, we really like your views that education should be hands-on, minds-on, and hearts-on. So thank you so much, Dr. Pratibha. And uh, I would like to request uh, next uh, Professor Gautam uh, to kindly share your thoughts on this. So over to you, Dr. Menon. I want to thank you, Soumya, Shagun and Sudhira for organizing this and the whole FCAP 2020 Secretariat for putting all of this together. It's very nice to have the discussion because earlier we would have them in one particular location and only the people in that location could actually come to it. But now it's using technology, it's possible to have much more input from across the country by which we can think about these problems. I want to start by one particular term that has come up in our discussions with the ST, STIP 2020 education process, which is the idea of an engaged university. And I think this idea is very important when we think about human resources. Our largest human resource is the students who will pass through our education process. And we can ask of this, what is our education supposed to give them? What are the skills that it's supposed to endow them with? What sort of training are they supposed to have? And we talk about capacity development, what capacity are we talking about? What is the capacity that's important, A, to the students, B, to the country as well, when we talk about the sort of people that we want to turn out? The engaged university is the idea of an educational system. It's not just university, but colleges, schools, et cetera, that have a link with the society that surrounds them and link with local needs that surround them. And in a sense, this is where innovation really comes from. You, it is impossible to innovate unless you understand the context of your innovation, to understand who is the, the people who will benefit from your innovation. From that point of view, I think it's possible to say that we haven't really been a success. Our education system has not been successful in really creating young people who engage with the society at any significant level. In a bunch of committees that I sit in, I, I listen to reports about colleges telling you about what they've done in the previous years, and so on, the curb garden that they set up, their interaction with villagers to teach them something, family planning, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
But all of these typically are projects which are come from these institutions and then are taken out to the recipients or the beneficiaries of these ideas. There's no sense in which you initially go out with a completely open mind to find out what is it that your community, that your society, that your local needs are, and then construct not over a year, not over a six month project, not over a year's project, but essentially over a series of years to find out what is the best way to engage with those problems? What is the best way that in particular science and technology can engage and make a difference to those particular problems that we're thinking about? But I think the main purpose of education, as far as we can, is to, con is to, is to not only produce students who are trained in particular areas, for example, students who are trained in biology or in physics or in mathematics, but also to, to allow them to, to understand the benefits of these in the context of the society and of the groups in which they actually live in. So that's where I think we really need to work much harder to create the sense of engagement. And this will also address things that have been raised earlier by the other panelists, which is how do you create education that is truly interdisciplinary? In order to find out what it is that a community needs, it's not, it's not as though you can say that, look, I'm going to stick to physics or I'm going to stick to mathematics. And I'm going to ask those questions that come out naturally from them. The problems that a community might have are not just restricted to just those small set of sciences. You have to involve social sciences, you have to involve language, you have to involve communication, you have to involve sociology, anthropology, in order to understand what is it that those needs are. And very importantly, what are the ethics of finding out what those needs are, of ensuring that ethical boundaries are not transgressed and finding out what, in addressing those particular problems that we actually have. So in the seeds of this interaction are really the seeds of interdisciplinarity, of training students how to think in, and just interdisciplinary, in, in, in an interdisciplinary way about problems that are really important to them. The other important thing is, again, to the whole act of being entrepreneurial is an act of constantly failing until you finally get it right. This is something that we don't teach our students to do. We, even our labs are typically constructed so that there is, you have to get those answers correctly. There is no wrong answer. So we're already predisposing our students to think that one must, there is an underlying answer which one must get. There is no scope for failure. There is no scope for error in that. Again, this is important to teach. We should teach our students how to fail and how to fail creatively and how to absorb those lessons of that failure until finally you get something that comes right. The last point that I wanted to make in this connection after having talked about the engaged university is when you think about education in a larger context, again, what are the HR needs of education? We should not confuse process with outcome. When we talk about process, I always sort of imagine, I, I think of the story that was told to me by, by Professor at IIT Kanpur, who we were walking together about a student from some years before, of who had written the IIT exam, didn't get a good grade, so went back and wrote the exam again until he finally got what he really wanted, which is computer science at IIT Kanpur. Once he was at IIT Kanpur, he was struggling to maintain even a minimal GPA of about 6.0. He had confused process with outcome. The process of getting into an IIT is not really the outcome of what an IIT education, you know, indeed of what any educational system should teach you. We should not confuse the act of learning with the end result of that learning, the product of that learning, which is to make you a person who is better integrated with society, a person who understands societal needs and is able to address those needs from multiple points of view. Our system is not, not sort of set up to encourage all of these. If we make students specialize too early in what they want to do, we don't encourage interdisciplinarity. For example, students who do biology typically are students who dislike mathematics. But biology nowadays needs mathematics as much as it does need chemistry and many other areas. So the fields of tomorrow, the research fields of tomorrow that Pukka Jalote talked about, are fields that must necessarily combine many different backgrounds, many different areas together. And we have to ask, how is it that we can construct an educational system that best does this, that doesn't encourage over-specialization too early, but train students inappropriately how to learn new things, as well as how to communicate. And that's the last point that I wanted to make. It's important to do these two things, to teach students, if you want to take to students, to teach them how to learn more than anything else. Again, do not confuse process with outcome. You have to teach and do not, conf and do not confuse the fact that the C++ of today may be the Python of tomorrow, maybe it's something else completely different five years down the line. So in being very, very specific about the, about the instruction that you wish to impart, you should not forget the fact that it's really the process of learning that is important to understand. And not only that, it's very important for the students, for the HR, for the, for the uh, human resources of the next 10 or 20 years 
to also learn how to communicate. So this is something, again, that we tend to miss out in much of our education. We don't emphasize the value of communication as we should, as much as certainly we should. I'll stop with that, and I will come back to some of these points a little later when these questions come up. And thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Menon, and all these thought-provoking ideas about engaging university and students widely linked with local communities, understand the co connectivity with society, uh, interdisciplinary education, and education, what community needs. Very important point, these are these ethics in education, and also about learn from the universities, and outcome of learning is important. So uh, these are really very important uh, points. Uh, and so let's now move to the uh, next part of our session and start taking questions uh, from the audience. So, uh, so I want to move to Sudhira. So, Sudhira, what is trending in social media now? Uh, over to you, Sudhira. Thank you, Samya. Thank you, everyone, uh, for those insightful uh, remarks. I think there's there's, there's a much wider uh, sort of spectrum of things that we need to address. Uh, while we pick up questions, there are a few questions coming up. While I bring them up, uh, I want to just take on. Uh, with something that Professor Jalote started off as a pyramid. As in, uh, uh, I have a different uh, sort of a view on how our education system is currently structured. As in, one of my professors, uh, Professor Jagdish at IIC, used to tell uh, that this is like a multi stage uh, rocket. In the sense, I can also uh, relate to with the statistics or numbers in, in the perspective of Karnataka with respect to the students here. 18 lakh students who take up class 10th examination, of which about 70 percent make it. And only about 10 lakhs you know, appear for plus two examinations, of which again you have about 60 to 70 percent uh, who pass out. So we are already there at 6 to 7 lakhs from 18 lakhs. And then we have about, about a lakh or so who get up and get into engineering, education, and medical. And then perhaps about two lakhs who get into other diploma and degree colleges. So we are really looking at, like, even if it comes to uh, higher degrees like PhDs or masters, there, we really have very less numbers. Question as the I think larger question as is to also look at or perhaps I'm sure the panel is already grappling with is what happens to the rest as in between 10 to 18 lakhs that we already dropped who dropped out of the system as in that's what happens when a rocket is launched and it drops off right as in the case of the fuel thing that gets gets off so I think the challenge for us is to also to look at what happens to the rest who drop off at multiple levels as in between plus two and 10 or 10th and plus two and so similarly further higher up. The other context I also want to bring in from, from uh, a very different perspective on, on the human resources and in terms of employment and other things is that in India, we are, hardly have less than 10% of, you know, like about 40% of, about working population, hardly there are less than 10% of them are in the organi organized sector. And this is most of us who you, like you and me were filing taxes and all of it, but a large segment, almost more than 40 crores of working population are in the unorganized sector. Now, the challenge for, I think, for our education is, like I said, those who dropped off, right? Like some from 10 to plus two and all of them who are in, who are out there and we really don't know what, what skilling, what they require and all of it. I think one of the things that most of our system currently focuses is, is on employability. Shouldn't we start looking at radically or need a radical shift in looking at uh, trying to promote entrepreneurship and innovation than employability as a key goal there? In fact, even for that's a key question that people ask when when you have PhDs coming out is that where, where are they getting recruited? As in, we have kind of created a system in, in place where you are seeing that uh, even be it in science, technology, and innovation or related to STEM domains that uh, we have not trained people to look at, explore uh, beyond employability. What are your takes on that? Uh, Professor Jalote, I know you, have, you wanted to leave early, so I would request you to first respond, and then we'll on, move on to the rest, uh, the other panelists. Okay, so uh, uh, I know entrepreneurship is the flavor of the day. Uh, we also have entrepreneurship in IIIT we started, but I'm a firm believer entrepreneurship is not First of all, it's not like engineering. See, in engineering, you teach the student something, and if the student has learned, out comes an engineer. Doctor, the same thing. Entrepreneurship is not like that. I think we completely mistake it. Okay, you teach the person entrepreneurship, and out comes an entrepreneur. Doesn't happen. Number one. 
Number two, entrepreneurship is far too to uh, this thing with the overall society, right? You can't have entrepreneurs if the society cannot absorb too much entrepreneurship. So, so while I'm completely for it, I don't see it as a panacea. I don't see it as replacing anything. Yes, I think in the past we were training too many uh, students to try to look at only job as an option. It's a good thing to expose them to. But I think it seems to be, you know, I, I, I really still stay very firmly grounded in terms of education that it has to have rigor. It has to have this thing. You ought to be able to go and get a good job and do a good, I mean, a good position in a good company or wherever and do a good job there. Now, whether you choose not to and do entrepreneurship is something you should you should have some skills to be able to do it. So yes, I'm all for it, but not in the way people are saying as if it is going to uh, take away all our employment problems and everyone will become entrepreneur. And uh, so I'm afraid that I don't subscribe to that. Thank you for your views. As in, uh, I think uh, maybe I didn't frame it properly as in I was looking at appropriate skilling that you know, it's not necessarily- No, I, I might say it's not you. Please don't don't take it as a. I mean, you are. I just see everywhere you go, there is now talk. Uh, so to be to be sometimes just since we are at it, I mean, there is a lot of many issues in higher education, the quality, or rigor of what we teach, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is one of the piece. But I think over the last few years, I see a lot more being talked about entrepreneurship rather than, for example is the quality of math we teaching, is the quality of science we teaching, is the quality of engineering we teaching, we not, et cetera, et cetera. But having said all that, all I'm saying is entrepreneurship is a good thing. We must have students exposure to it, but let us not forget that no matter which way you look at it, 80, 90% of the graduates should and would probably pick up jobs. A few percent will go for research and a few percent will go for entrepreneurship. That's the way it ought to be, not that, uh, bulk of our graduates will start going for entrepreneurship. I don't think the ecosystem can support it. No, uh, thank you, uh, Professor. But I, I think uh, the context I was trying to bring in was neither the government nor the private sector together cannot observe all folks who will come into employment. And there'll be challenges for providing employment at, at large. In the sense, I don't think that as in, I may be naive there, but I think if you look at farmers across, they have been entrepreneurs in some sense. As in they have been self-taught and trying to do things there. My point was as in how do we equip the students across so that they can be self-reliant, independent, creative, and all of those things like many of the other panelists have already brought in. In any case, I, I, I do subscribe to what you said as in, in that I'm, sense. You know, I'm sure others would have good views. Yeah, right. Please go ahead. Thank you. I'll be leaving in five minutes. Please go ahead. Sure. Yeah. Uh, Professor Menon or Dr. Jolly, would you want to respond? Uh, I put uh, uh, come in on this. Uh, sorry. Yeah, you can hear me. Um, yes. But, um, you know, uh, I agree with Professor Jolote that uh, you cannot uh, really say that set up an incubation center, uh, uh, have startups, entrepreneurs, unless you have created those uh, competencies. And uh, um, one size doesn't fit all. So uh, there is so much of diversity in the kind of talent and uh, um, uh, that students bring. So many people will follow their own path. And exceedingly, these paths are nonlinear. So sometimes, you know, students may take a lateral exit and try to set up something of their own as a group and so on. Engineering institutions, people are doing that a lot. Uh, but we should not close the doors for formal education on them or coming back to academia and uh, moving forward again. So you have to build in nonlinearity because uh, um, with so much happening and so many options available to the young, there will be sampling. And uh, uh, entrepreneurship, as has been said uh, very correctly, you know, the risks are high. And we have to prepare our students for um, taking a risk and uh, moving, uh, okay. exploring new directions and being able to then uh, you know, settle, find their own balance in life. But I do certainly believe that if we were to introduce design and design thinking early enough, then we would 
provide the kind of skills and uh, 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 that are needed uh, to move away from uh, some of the well cataloged jobs and to create your own path. And that those experiences we don't give enough. So I always, always go back to project based learning, which begins very early. And that I believe that very young also can be given the skills that will now be uh, will take them to disruptive technologies very, very quickly, the exponential technologies, because the three R's is not what defines literacy anymore. Uh, algorithmic thinking has to come in very early. And, you know, when I speak of technology, uh, uh, empower enriched education, it does not mean always digital. It does not always mean ICT. If you were to even say with low cost, uh, whatever is available, set up an experiment, maybe a pendulum with the mahogany flowers and you keep plucking uh, petals and uh, studying uh, how does its uh, oscillation vary when the mass change takes, that is also technology. That is a design of a experiment. So I feel that we need to encourage that through creativity labs and uh, so on. And uh, as we move forward in high school and in colleges and not entrepreneurship, but enterprise education must become a part of our education and there should be a policy on that. And there's a subtle difference between learning to, you know, um, be entrepreneurs uh, uh, means necessarily that you are linked up with uh, building an organization or a venture that will be commercially viable and so on. And it will have to have a need based and uh, so on. But enterprise education really is an application of creative ideas and innovations to any practical situation. So if you're talking of an engaged university, you go to a village and you find that you have to help them with, let's say, a water problem and so on, to be able to build that, um, that you know, a solution to a problem that community throws up do you understand how to build a project? So enterprise education would teach you all that. It would also link cultural, economic, and intellectual and social values into it. So an enriched enterprise education can be a starting point. Out of that, a small cohort will, will you know, it'll organically, they will go on to have startups and so on. They will see that the idea can early enough, I mean, a mobile app or something, or you know, some other need-based thing, it could just be a craft, it could be a product, uh, will lead to an entrepreneurship. So enterprise education, project-based learning, and within projects-based learning, building in complementary skills and competencies. Um, so a group project and uh, cognitive apprenticeship or apprenticeship within the institution with faculty, students, learning together doing a project together is what i think will deliver and uh, uh, developing a product be it an educational resource or a need of a community or your own institution will enrich enterprise and from there organically people will move on and so just teach them a bit of um, bit of financial literacy and so on not everybody likes it and uh, you will engender the skills that will take on to entrepreneurship thank you uh uh thank you so much for this uh, elaborate response to that uh so then would you want to add a quick note on that before we move to the next question no i think all of these points are very good and certainly yeah. there's certain points that i think and the only sort of uh, the only addition that i might want to make is that i do agree with Pankaj that it's it was, it's hard to teach entrepreneurship as is you can set the stage for it you can prepare students for it and as Pratiba said Financial literacy is certainly a part of that, basically the economics. Communication is important. Again, you have to be able to sell an idea. You have to be able to communicate to people who might want to, to, to invest in, in whatever it is that you want to do. The idea of collaborating, which again, Pratipa brought out very well, of project-based education, is one where you can bring people together to accomplish certain things that on their own they could not have accomplished. I think by making students aware more generally of careers outside the very specific one that they have chosen or they think that the education prepares them for is one way of doing that. And certainly that I think is important, but otherwise I agree with all the points that they raised. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Menon. I think we have a question from YouTube on YouTube uh, by Asta Sharma. She's sort of posing this to uh, Dr. Ghosh, uh, particularly uh, relating to the holistic learning on, and teaching students how to think ima and imagine. Uh, she notes that most undergraduate programs in public universities are not research intensive. 
So introducing more research intensive undergrad programs can also help students learn how to think instead of simply memorizing facts. Uh, Dr. Ghosh, would you want to res respond to that in the sense? Uh, yes, uh, it's a very, very deep question actually. And I think uh, what I propagate, you know, we have been experimenting with that is uh, learning by doing. When somebody comes and lectures to you in radio mode, uh, you know, maximum 10%, you remember what has been said. When you see something, you remember more. So uh, uh, you hear something, you forget. You listen to something, you remember. But when you do with your hands, you understand. So even when you fail, that knowledge stays with you. It's not end of the exam, delete button, your memory is as fresh as ever. That's not learning. So I think it is true. So whichever way we do, uh, I don't want to go to the uh, philosophy and the, you know, the pedagogy of constructivism and all of it. That's not the point. You can call it by any name. But the idea is students cannot be passive learners because if they're passive learners, that's not really learning. So they have to actively participate in their learning process. And I think the entire pedagogy there has to be improved. And I think that's what I meant. You know, I made many points very, very quickly, but I completely agree with you. This is the way it has to be. The teaching learning process has to be uh, exploratory. You know, it would be fun and then it would be real knowledge for that. The point that has been made by other panelists already is that we need to train our teachers. The teacher's role has shifted from being the storehouse of information that we used to be, the sage on the stage, to guide by the side. Because information is available to the students at the click of a button. You don't need to be the faculty knowing all. You need to be the mentor by the side by charting out the path for individual learners. And that becomes very difficult in public systems where you have hundreds of people. But a technology comes to your rescue, actually. You can tune in to uh, the design of a particular pace and liking and the background of uh, your learners. And I think this has to be hands-on. And I think Pratima's phrase is, is a beautiful one, you know, hands-on, minds-on, hearts-on. I mean, absolutely, that's the complete thing. On your previous thing, I can't help commenting. You know, I already made a comment on that. But, you know, we tend to always look at things in either or situation, as if it's this or that it's not either or for no country it has been so i think when you ex give this exploratory kind of a flavor to education some of them will go to uh, innovation some of them will go to invention of the kind i'm talking about that's a rigorous route sometimes innovation is just about uh, tweaking a technical specification to your needs right and then it becomes so it's a completely different ways of growing and I think the point we are all making, and we did not rehearse, but you know, all your panelists should is saying the same thing. You know, we do not want to put that cap on our students to say, stop thinking and now do as I am telling you to do. And I think that is the problem. The problem is a, an elephant and a fish and a monkey cannot be given the same, uh, you know, benchmark like the quote you had uh, of statistics. I hardly care. You know, our exam system has failed because you know it tries to judge everybody for uniformity, for being fair. That's not fair, it's extremely unfair. And I think we are waking up, it's a very valid question. And I think we should be opening it up, but not a make a mess of it. We are talking again of a system and not individuals in Himalayas. So the system has to be rigorous so that it doesn't lead to anarchy, at the same time gives you the flexibility. So extremely good point. Great, great. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Bosch on that. That was uh, really, again, very insightful. And Hopefully, we'll be able to uh, synthesize all of them. And as we frame, uh, go about this policy, I think we'll be taking it up. Uh, I'll take up the next thing that has come in. Like, I guess one of the uh, comments that has come in is that, uh, you know, uh, interacted with teachers across and students as well. Uh, sort of a complaint that there is too much of science at a plus two level. Sorry, there is some noise. Noise, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Let me rephrase or go back a, a minute or so. As in, basically, one of the uh, comments that we hear, uh, particularly in high school or even plus two level, is that there is too much of science that is being uh, sort of, you know, tried to put into students there. As in, for instance, in plus two biology, why should somebody who may not really pursue research or something in in, in science should learn recombinant DNA or something to do with uh, gel electrophoresis and stuff like that. 
as in uh, is that level of detailing important or uh, as in uh, instead of trying to make science interesting are we trying or are we overdoing that's on the one hand on the other hand there is also a need to have you know, an improve an overall quality of higher education uh, particularly addressing a whole lot of skills and competencies that Mr. Gautam and many others have you already brought in including communication and a host of things so now how do we increase these linkages of higher education and all this with society and economic entities in, in the community and beyond to uplift these skilled human resources. Uh, uh, who would want to go first? As in, uh, Dr. Shakila, would you want to come in? Yeah, so I think uh, the curriculum over something that uh, is a matter of concern for all of us. Um, I mean, it's been some, uh, you know, uh, at least I don't know how many of you all have read the national education policy, but what we have said is there are stages of learning uh, where you need to actually migrate from a foundational stage and then build on to it when you come to the conceptual level. Unfortunately, uh, the schooling system, and I think it becomes critical for us to understand that all the 21st century skills that we're talking, which needs to be there in higher education, really starts to uh, it really needs to be addressed at a very early age. And um, we, in fact, in the policy, have put forward a point of view where we are talking about an early child care education and starting it from the age three to six, where many thought that we were talking about a downward progression of class one going to the age three, which is not what we are trying to say. We are trying to say a discovery-based learning because the brain development and Neurosciences have shown us that the neural networks are at its, you know, optimal best to assimilate at the in the ages that the brain is developing between the ages of three to six. Now, what we have actually, and that is where you find that uh, a set of students who have come with very good nutritional levels and who have come from well-to-do families, their ability to assimilate has been much better than children from families who are not having that kind of uh, level and the preparedness. So a lot of preparedness is very critical to talk about all these 21st century skills that we are talking about. And this has to be built on at a has to be built upon equally stage. As what the comment has come to you is do we need to go into so much detailing? It depends on what age you're talking about. So if you start looking at the detailing in biology or in mathematics or in uh, social sciences at a much earlier age than when the learner's preparedness is there to assimilate it, it would definitely be stressful for the learners. But if you're talking about it at a level of abstraction and conceptualization, which needs to come in in a 14 year old, it has to be because you can't simplification of knowledge as you reach higher. So if you were to look at the kind of learning ladder that you need to learn everything. That significantly higher and higher and higher the thinking skills that we are talking about has to be developed ages between 14 to 18. And much further. Now, I'm talking about the, uh, the how do we actually ensure that in higher education students speak 21st century skills of, and of problem with cognitive game and the first. I think uh, there is a bit of an issue uh, from Dr. Shakila's side. So, Dr. Shakila, you can uh, uh, stop your video and you can continue. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I'll just try that. I'll just try that. Yeah. Uh, am I audible now? Yes, yes, yes. We need to get the 21st century skills that we're talking about that higher education students need to be equipped with is something which Professor Ghosh and others, have, all of us have been talking about in the panel, 
is not uh, something that would really be developed we actually put them through those kind of uh, let us say hands on training we're talking about so for example giving them apprenticeship with projects that are actually forcing them to work as a team together in a project mode looking at encouraging them to have cognitive thinking and critical uh, thinking and allowing them to actually transport a problem and find a solution for it a problem solving kind of an approach these are things that go through the activities that happen in higher education unfortunately system which has been examination oriented where marks become the only critical uh, trajectory not our nurturing of these kind of skills and very rightly so you had put this question of how do we look at see let us i think that debate i point higher education need not have the entire set of people the entire set of that cohort coming into higher education no country can afford to do that where you have 100% ger in higher education you don't want to achieve that because you should have a sizable number of them who would like to go into skilling or who would like to go into the arts or who would like to go into entrepreneurship become innovators become creators of uh, knowledge and then go on to maybe uh, coming back into the system or even uh, maybe contributing to the economy are you still able to hear me uh, sudhira yes very clearly yeah so uh, basically i think we should not great there are people who would not really like to think of higher education being the end for themselves that all of them need not like if you say higher education should we have a system where everyone in the um, uh, pipeline thinks of only acquiring a phd no i don't think we should so let us allow children to choose their paths like earlier panelists have said decide for themselves but allow them to excel in that field a kind of ecosystem where the teachers the educational system does not penalize a student for thinking differently so now we are talking that a 3 year old child and a 3 6 we should have a playway method and allow the child to have a flexible manner in which the child will assimilate things that are happening around and do a discovery based learning such a child if at the a lsc at class 3 is able to learn coding i think you are actually trying to create that kind of innovation in that child so we need to really reorder our curriculum in a manner that the curricula overload is reduced the the density of the content is reduced and the applications of knowledge which will make our children have all the 21st century skills are actually honed up because they are living in a in a age where most of us i think were in education and we have been fortunate for 40 years we have been in that field and we are still surviving in that field but the generation that is coming the millennials of today cannot have that luxury that we've had they are living in a world of uncertainty of dynamic changes that are happening and unless they have these kind of skills that are there you know which allows them to adapt to the changing economic needs and the changing jobs and the fact of the threat of a machine which will overtake the human mind which uh, dr gosh was very kind enough to say that because of our human intelligence that can never happen but if you see a lot of the uh, sci fi movies you will have a lot of anxieties and fears that come to you but ultimately artificial intelligence and 3d and data mining and big data all these have to be within the power of the child have to be within the power of our student to do that we need to change the manner of our curricular the approach to curricula and i really appreciate that youngster in saying do we really need to go into that detailing not for a 6 year old but if you were to do it for a 14 year old yes so i think the question is um, putting forward a spectrum laying down your learning outcomes i have a famous term of unbundling the learning outcomes 
and that has to be at a very very micro level where it is very specific learning outcomes that you have so frame your curricula to suit those your objectives of the curricula should suit those specific learning outcomes that you're looking at and those learning outcomes must embed within themselves all these so called skills that we are looking at so inquiry based learning problem solving our hands on experiencing did we not all play with the mud you remember we had clays and we used to make models where do we do that children do not even appreciate that why did vocational education be treated as secondary to the main education because we thought learning with the hands was something wrong it's not so every single food grain we take from a farmer is grown by the hand every single piece of creation that is there is with the hands and we have to break that mindset to think that everybody needs to come into higher education encourage skill based learning encourage the kind of thing where we actually say learn by actually dealing with nature and most importantly i think it is the integrity of thought and the value system that our children should in a technologically driven world not be carried away in a highly you know to only think that incubation and commercialization and finally the product and how rich i become everybody cannot be uh, a person i mean let us not think as the commercial value of a product being an end goal for it. the education should be able to make a better human being with at the same time being able to contribute uh, to the economy so i i don't know i Uh, whether I, it's my passion to tell that this is what i would like to see the indian education system becoming and i hope we will be able to reach there some day no no this was fantastic you really articulated this very well uh, clearly i think the end goal is to make a better citizen and contribute to the nation building or improving the quality of life at large and i think uh, i guess you you given your expertise in this i think you really nicely summed it up very well Uh, I would now request Somya to uh, continue with the questions. Over uh, to you. Yeah. yeah okay. Uh, thank you so much, Sudhira, uh, and thank you so much, uh, Shakila, for uh, uh, very nice insights about unbundling terms and holistic development, inquiry-based learning, enough skills. Uh, so it's very uh, important uh, suggestions for step. Uh, so uh, my next question. So move to next question. Uh, my next question is uh, for Professor Nayan. Uh, so it is very important for the excellence in research for higher education system to be connected to each strata for developing skill human resources in India. So uh, means how STI policy can leverage innovation to improve the skill human resources. Uh, your thoughts on prioritizing research agenda setting to the needs of the country. So that, so that again goes back to this term that I mentioned at the beginning, the engaged university or engaged learning. Yeah. And I think these ideas really are part of that. That the more you are sensitive to the needs of your community, the more easy it is to find research problems that address them. And it's not as though there's any lack of these problems. It's just that we haven't been looking at them. So when we think of a research agenda, typically now. we usually think of agendas that often come from outside us they come from the west that is the problem that people outside think are important and therefore we are aligned with them but there are huge problems within our country these are called the technical term for these are wicked problems because they're extremely interdisciplinary the problem of global warming is one the problem of ecology of the degradation of ecology is another water pollution air pollution in our cities all of these are very fundamental to how both we our children people who who come after us will have to live in the city that we create over the next 20 50 100 years so it's not as though we have any lack of problems and it's not as though these are not genuine scientific problems to access and it's not as though they don't affect every strata of society and this is why and it's not as though every strata of society does not have some vested interest poor or rich in determining the quality of air that they breathe so as i said there are problems that really are there in the community that we should address much more because no one else will look at them for us it's our ecology it's our it's our forests it's our landscapes it's our urban ecology that we are most concerned with not people from outside so that's where i think we should look for the new set of research problems i mean it's not as though all of research should be targeted to this but i think there is a case for more sensitivity to the sort of problems that come within our society those that surround us 
rather than looking for problems that are very, very far away from the sort of context that we might normally encounter. Am I audible? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. Lennon, for uh, this perspective. Actually, we have also uh, different questions from YouTube uh, platform also. Uh, a question uh, by Dr. Uh, Chandrasekhar Sethi. YouTube. So uh, his question is to how uh, to balance the demographic issues, local problem, and universal competition. Means what should be the policy from government? So uh, I just want uh, to ask this question to you, uh, Professor Menon, because uh, you uh, have given some suggestions regarding local problem and universal competition. So uh, can I uh, this question with you? Can you just repeat the question? Yeah. Can you just repeat the question? So yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. Actually. Uh, the question is how to balance the demographic issues, the local problem, and universal competition. It means what should be uh, in the policy from the government. So this is question from T. Chandra Shekhar Rastetti in YouTube. So uh, can we uh, go with this question? Yeah, I mean, certainly that I think demographic issues are really important for us. We have a large number of people in the age group of about 12 to, to about 15 to about 30, 35. And this is a cohort that will really determine where we go with in, as a country over the next 20 to 30 years. Again, I would sort of go back to saying that we have to ask ourselves questions of what is the nature of the training that we expect them to have? What are the next nature of the problems that we as a country would like to solve? And to ensure that these are integrated together. And I think that this is certainly an important important issue for us to consider. Maybe we should ask the other panelists also to what, what their views yeah. are on, on this particular issue. Yeah. yeah. So I think uh, we have to move with, uh, because we have several questions uh, with us. So uh, another question is on online education. So uh, this question is uh, to you, uh, Professor Ghosh. The online education appears to be a new normal uh, because this is replacing the classroom teaching. How do you think this would affect the university education? And what do you think could be the enablers in preserving the quality of teaching and education? Several state government are uh, in uh, this quadri to enable the certain uh, whether we should permit online education or not. So will it deliver? Uh, this question is to you, uh, Dr. Ghosh. Yes, I think we have been facing this a lot. And uh, let me just say uh, the learning from the last four months, which is something that uh, is not new. And if you are attending from the beginning, you know, I started by saying, I don't believe in knee-jerk reactions to even to a crisis. And I think leadership is all about that perspective. Uh, what we are finding out is that, uh, and there have been many articles, the recent one in online uh, hired ed, basically is saying that online education is not the future. I, I'll give you my perspective and uh, the hands-on learning or everything that we are talking about, much of it gets lost in the online transaction. When you're talking about even COVID research, our AI and uh, you know uh, the virtual environment is not that great either to be able to do COVID research uh, in a remote way. So I think I need researchers in my labs to carry out the projects that we are doing. We need hands-on training for many uh, particularly in medical uh, nursing, you look at anything, you know, absolutely necessary. So there are, of course, we are, we'll continuously, we are trying to bridge that gap, whatever technology could do, does it very well, it's, uh, foolish not to accept that. So we should be coming into that blended format, but it's also becoming very clear that two kinds of students, students who go, go for full-fledged online degrees are the ones probably are already in the market. They are already in a job, they need upskilling, and they're geared towards getting another credential. Whereas university education, according to me, is not about getting a credential. And I think all of us have been saying it in different words today in your meeting, that uh, it's not about getting a cred credential, it's a 360 degree uh, experience. Much of it comes from the science on learning I'm talking about, peer-to-peer -peer interaction. You learn from your peers. 
And breakout groups are, of course, doing it in online, and I'm really struggling. We are one of the first to go online completely on 16th of March. And uh, completed our semester today. I'm bidding farewell to my graduating class, and 15th, we'll have a graduation day celebration. But the point is that there are two kinds. Our faculty members enjoyed getting to a new medium. You know, I think I expected it the wrong way. I thought my faculty would revolt. They're the ones who are enjoying it. Our students started showing fatigue because uh, they were missing the campus like hell, and they wanted to come back to the physical campus. Even today, you know, I'm flooded with meals of that kind. So the student capability of learning online and the rest of it that they're missing, we need to do a serious thinking about it. In my view, uh, we are going to go for a hybrid, which we knew, and it's nothing new. It's pre-COVID also we knew it. It's just that I was thinking of doing it next year. I'm doing it this month. You know, it has <laughs> accelerated the journey a bit. Uh, and, and nothing else. This was in our thinking anyway. Make the best of both. Make the best of technological help and make the best of face-to-face -face transactions wherever you need to. So I think it will be foolish not to make use of the two. But I think the brick and mortar universities are not going to go away. Physical campuses are here to stay. The kind of students that they attract, they come there for 360 degree education of a different kind. At the same time, the same campuses like one we are capable of offering fully online degrees. And we'll do it, but the, that cohort would be for lifelong learning our own alumni uh, you know, in, in this era, you cannot have, Shakila said it nicely, 40 years you can't have because I had a degree in physics and then I have managed, you know, so every five years they have to upscale. So they would be lifelong learners and many of it would be facilitated by the online platform. But the limitations of technology is also becoming very obvious to us. So I think uh, it, it, it enables, but it also limits. Face-to-face -face enables, but it also limits. Best is to make a hybrid system of the two. And I think there's a lot of pedagogical uh, changes that we are seeing right now and a lot of brainstorming going on you know it's really huge and i'm enjoying it i call it a good crisis because from this crisis there's a got a lot of good learning and i think uh, so i i think we are going for again two different kinds of models and this was clear to us even earlier now it's becoming clearer thanks uh, yeah. thank you uh, thank you Thank you so much, Dr. Ghosh, for this uh, very important insight about online education. Uh, so can we uh, move forward uh, with another question to Dr. Pratibha? Uh, so uh, what are your views on scaling of community college means, uh, for vocational, uh, vocational education and other schemes uh, with greater participation from industry? As we are aiming to become Atmanirbhar, a larger question comes, how to be competent as well? It's how STI policy and MHRD initiative can aim to achieve quality assurance in various fields of education and education. So, uh, we do, Dr. So, uh, you know, so much has been said about community colleges and uh, it gets related to the government scheme, the UGC scheme of uh, uh, bivocation. Now, uh, bivoc as it's called and so on. But we need to look at uh, what the connotation of this term was in the West and how we have implemented it. And, uh, you know, the uh, given the 1.3 billion of which uh, almost, you know, and look at the huge percentage that is young and that needs to be skilled and uh, made employable, um, uh, we need to really be uh, introspective about the schemes that were launched earlier, how well they have performed, what is the data, what is the evidence. We also need to look at what is the job market and the disconnect between industry and uh, you know uh, those who are seeking the jobs. So first, if I look at the UGC scheme, since you spoke of community college, in our uh, uh, country, it was floated in a very limited way because in existing institutions or campuses, be they universities or colleges, um, you know, the, these institutions could apply to have a community college within their own uh, campus and uh, offer this BWOC course. And the number was in hundreds, you know, and if ICT took it, um, maybe UGC just had what about say 160-ish and uh, uh, AICT with engineering, uh, um, uh, background, they had about 1200 colleges and so on. And so, you know, if you are talking about the huge population that needs to get into the job market or have vocation, 
then uh, they have not served the purpose. And two has already been said, and they said that, you know, we assign too much value to family, the exam and the degree and the social status is given to those who will go through this uh, uh, university degree program without looking at where they started, where they ended up. You know, I may have a huge, uh, say, uh, honors in science batch that ends up doing an MBA or going into banking and uh, or uh, into other uh, non-academic, non-research jobs as well, and that's fine. Uh, uh, but uh, um, uh, it links to an earlier question as well. Uh, why should uh, we have too much of science given to this cohort if they're not going to stay in the profession? But without digressing to link to that earlier question, let me simply say that mm, uh, in open school, uh, B-vocation has worked, uh, uh, sorry, vocational education has worked a little better, but the repertoire has been very limited. One small example. So you say to a school, yes, you can have two streams of vocation. So supposing about 20% uh, of the students want to do it, not everybody wants to be an electrician or a plumber. You know, you may just have one and so on. So it's done in apprenticeship mode with industry. Two, I think the problems that have arisen at the school level, even at the open um, uh, schooling, uh, you know, about uh, for livelihood purposes. Those who opt for these want to move out of education, not sometimes out of choice, but also out of compulsion, and uh, they want to seek a livelihood. Now, uh, they may be pretty bright, and they may uh, sort of learn on the job, and they have the skills, but industry is not going to take someone that is under 18 years old. And therefore, they will really be, you know, sort of, uh, uh, you don't know what the skill level is, and they can't come back to get a, a certification. There has to be recognition of prior experience. Uh, though there is some, uh, there are frameworks available, but uh, uh, they need to be strengthened. They need to be thought through uh, much, much better. So one of the things is to pull out uh, uh, the, the, these capacity building programs out of the formal education systems and take them on as standalone institutions, which are part of, let us say, communities. They could be part of community centers. They could be part of village panchayats. They could be part of industry. So industry should really also say that it has, uh, uh, it has a, a responsibility even towards the school dropouts, you know? So a certain percentage should be given uh, learn while you earn kind of training so that uh, they can actually grow into those institutions. And this is something I think today, this connectedness everyone understands a little better when the migrants have made their way back to the villages. You do understand that how uh, you need people to build cities, you need to honor them, how industries and uh, even any uh, enterprise needs all these skills and they need to be valued. So I think that it is very important for us to have entities that are not just government driven entities. We understand that in non-formal ways, sometimes vocational education in apprenticeship mode can occur but much better in earn, uh, while we learn can occur better. And everybody in society has a responsibility. The employer, uh, be it in public domain, be it in private domain, has a responsibility. And communities have a responsibility. But that said, let me also say that uh, rather than scale up old schemes, let's have a paradigm shift. Um, de-glamorize general education, which I agree completely with Shakila Ji that, you know, uh, we just think that uh, having some degree, however unrelated it may be, is good. Because, uh, uh, of course, you know, uh, we have a smart population, and I say it with belief. And these people will find their way across, you know, uh, and their education, they will learn, and they will learn in formal and non-formal ways, and they will do a good job if we honor that each individual is distinct, will have a distinct path, career path and education path, and we need to honor that. But we need to also uh, saying that in formal education, we win a component of enterprise education. I don't like the term vocation somehow, but internationally it is accepted. I have given a choice, I would call it enterprise education. I would call it career stream. I would say, you know, glamorize it. 
all of us need a career and tomorrow i just may get so tired of my books and i will say like you know i want to go back to painting and i always used to say when i'm 40 i'm going to sit behind the potter's wheel 40 became 50 50 became 60 i didn't do it but you know there is always this desire all of us have to work with our hands and do more than one thing and uh, have some a value that we can add so probably we need to find uh, ways of informal education doing that. CB, the choice based credit system actually does have that. It has core courses, foundational courses, discipline domain courses. It also has skill based courses. But because of lack of facilities and the demand, you know, the large number of students, not enough teachers, same thing, you may decide as an institution to offer two skill based courses, even within a domain that they're related. Not everybody wants to do it. So going back that today with ICT and the possibility of uh, doing online courses, you can give students a choice that you, what do you want to do? Do that add-on course either with a community or an employer or as a micro-credential or nano-learning or micro-learning which is online and I have an academic credit bank which I'm going to weave this in your portfolio and give to you a competency certificate that will help you because we are a country that is driven by certificates but employers are not but it feels good to any individual you know to have a badge or a certificate that i've done this and large number of students are doing it without really knowing it and when we in stem have laboratory techniques and so on you know we have been actually giving to our students skills and uh, um, uh, sometimes uh, useful in the frontiers on research areas and undergraduate research and to um, I, know I put all my students and especially women students to some form of a product development because I myself missed it you know learn to do soldering a hacksaw and uh, uh, build something and so on so we have to create that environment that is so joyful and that is multi-dimensional that is a spiral curriculum our lives have to go around that way and therefore, let's not talk about a BWOC or a community college, but look at the responsibility of communities and different type of institutional entities to be available in the lifetime of a student to pick something from here and there. And they're smart. They are without our nudge creating those portfolios from themselves. And that is going to be very, very important. And uh, this, let me say, must go on even to the PhD level. Because how many of our PhDs, once they're in, they discover they don't have the research acumen, they're not enjoying it, but then they will go forward and they will then move from maybe in academia, they'll be the disenchanted academics or in research, or uh, just not producing something that is really innovative or useful, or go into other streams and be um, overqualified for that kind of a job and so on. So uh, we need to look at uh, giving them also lateral exits and skills which are there. So well, I mean, it's a complex idea yeah. and uh, uh, we can build on it. And so many yeah. of us are thinking about it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Pratika, for your views because we are running out of time. So uh, I'm, I'm going to move uh, with uh, my co-moderator, Sujira. So over to you, Sujira. Yeah. yeah. Thank you, Samya, and, and thank, thank you, everyone, for that insightful uh, discussions that we are having on. We've had uh, some questions that have come up on the YouTube. I just posted it in uh, the chat uh, window. It's by Dr. Archana Sharma and Professor Chaitanya Ali. So what they ask is, can't we have intra-university infrastructure for hands-on technology training, and how can cross-university networks be fostered without becoming convenient add-ons? Uh, who would want to go? Dr. Ghosh or Professor Manan? Or... I, can, I can start and, and Professor Ghosh can yeah. take over yeah. from that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so I think there's been some discussion around this already, but I think the idea of a hybrid campus, which combines both virtual and, and sort of physical infrastructure that you're associated with, will actually help. And this is something that we, sort of as, as a scientific community together, must examine where we can go with this idea. For example, I can sit in, in, in Pune and then listen to classes in, 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 in Delhi or take some set of classes in Delhi and then move back and forth. So where I am physically doesn't really matter very much anymore if we move to a more of a hybrid campus idea. The other reason is that, for example, in, in Chennai, 
between the Institute of Mathematical Sciences, the IIT Madras, the Madras University, and Anna University. All of us teach, for example, quantum mechanics, and all of us are within a region of about two kilometers of radius. So does it make sense to have so many parallel courses that are virtually identical, basically across where students could actually move around and attend these, as well as attend them virtually? These are models that we have not thought about earlier, but with a combination of both virtual and physical and the possibility of students moving, sharing infrastructure, moving between universities, these are things that we could think about doing now. And this is certainly something that we really should think about. Sorry, Great. someone else can. Dr. Ghosh, and then next, Dr. Shakil. Yeah, I, mean, I completely agree. And I think uh, I would not give a long answer because I think uh, Gautam has covered it uh, already. But you know, uh, if I can be very blunt, uh, our problem is we need to learn to uh, turn competitiveness into collaborations, collaborative spirit. You know, we talk about international collaborations much freely than we talk about national collaborations. And one nice thing that has happened with COVID is that uh, everybody has realized the importance of collaboration. I think uh, we are too competitive and maybe in our insecurities in this country, we are too inward looking. And I think it has to be an outward looking system. And I really uh, thank, thank uh, this question is very, very nice. So I think as a policy intervention, this has to come that uh, it, a policy that would prompt us to open up and be more collaborators than competitors. And I think sharing is a win-win situation. I've covered this already in my first five points. It's sharing is makes it all win-win. And uh, if it is based on complementary strength, you don't have to mimic what I am good at. I, you know, and I take from you what you are good at and together it's a win-win situation. I think that has to come. But the basic thing in there is what I talked about is quality assurance. If I think I'm doing charity, you know, I'm not going to be very, charity works up to a point. It doesn't work beyond for long-term because I cannot be feeling like just because I'm good, I'm doing some favor to somebody. It doesn't work. So India really needs to move the median to high up and have an active investment in moving the average to a much higher level so that people feel like contributing to each other and they see the gain in international collaboration because I am 200% convinced there is gain. <laughs> and we are learning from each other so much last two months and I, I really think there is nothing. What is this insecurity all about? So I think I completely agree, but it has to come through a policy framework. To take, so even if you have a little bit of a risk and you have a lot of procedural problems, you know, regulatory bodies telling us something or the other, and I think you need to look at that. All of us know that. And I think major problem for me is actually procedural. I mean, they would not allow me to do certain things. And though we are free to do it. So we are doing it privately. We are sort of, having these evening sessions where we open it up to each other because this is not under UGC or AICT or anybody, right? I mean, I can share knowledge, I can share webinars, but you know, to make it part of my regular offering would need a little bit of flexibility. And it's a very good question. And that's the way forward. I, I completely believe in that. That's the way forward. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Dr. Ghosh. Uh, if you have Dr. Shakila to have your remarks on this, please. Yeah, just start that uh, i hope i am both uh, audible and visible now uh, you're certainly audible okay i think i'll stop the audio yeah i'll just keep the audio yeah, yeah. Um, so i think uh, the point is very well taken because i think we are talking about networking and setting uh, higher education clusters uh, see ultimately you need to accept that uh, india is a resource constrained economy and uh, in a resource constrained economy, there is no point in replicating labs and limited uh, infrastructure that we have in institutions, uh, at least geographically in a But I must at the same time tell that our experience of financial wanted to set up a knowledge city in Mohali. And uh, like Dr. Ghosh and others have mentioned, how do you turn when two departments do not come together in a university to collaborate. The mindset we have, it's my proprietary right and not the other department's proprietary right. That mindset has got to change. At the same time, we need to also understand that sharing of resources is going to be the way forward. And we need education clusters that are created. It cluster where you have a university with colleges. 
to take up the schools also completely looking at a ecosystem of uh, education and therefore all these are intelligent now as dr gosh mentioned the regulatory system the regulatory system needs to be able to make the changes to suit the kind of flexible approach of resources and not hold the institution as a, a, a culprit or not penalize them for these kind of changes ultimately the bottom line of i think a first view the way forward is blend learning mode and we need to have, look you know using as the virtual sources to get to actually contribute to uh, the, the process of uh, knowledge sharing but it has to be equal partnership the point that dr gosh trying to say and we come have, we have colonial hangover where any is not a sustainable one. and i think in also the has come in very pertinent question that we need to have networks that networks we export to this be without really actually having of Uh, Dr. Shakila, I think we lost audio. We lost it. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, I think we are coming to the end, as in it's almost eight o'clock already here, and uh, I, would, I would really, uh, I think we'll connect with Dr. Shakila to get her on this and to kind of take this up uh, as we close this. Uh... I, I, I didn't know. Have we closed the time altogether? Uh, we are almost nearing the end, Dr. Shakila. I'm so sorry, yeah. but I think uh, we'll try to wrap it up. But one of us will certainly connect with you to kind of get your views on this and take it forward. Before we wrap it up, uh, I have a rapid fire. I request you uh, to kind of give a 30 second thing on what is it you would want to see on this aspect uh, that should come in, uh, in the STI policy 2020. Uh, I'll start. I think I would request all of you to be really as uh, precise and concise as possible because we've already overshot the time. Uh, Dr. Shakila? Uh, Sorry, I'm, I think we're still yeah. unable to hear you. Yeah. Uh, just cognitive knowledge and uh, technology based learning but also the university based uh, and what Dr. Bhaji likes to call as enterprise education as the way forward. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you Dr. Shakila. I'm not sure if all of us could hear you completely I, as in, but I think uh, we'll try to gather it with you separately and try to disseminate it appropriately. Thank you so much. Uh, Professor Venan. As I said, I'd like to see more engagement at all levels of education with society and to try to see where it is and how it is that we can engage better with social needs and social requirements. A brief word about a question that was asked you a little earlier about why is it that we have so much of learning to do in science subjects that we really need to know all this. And that's one question, but I would argue that another thing that we need to do is to just integrate them better. And to show that you know, it, life doesn't divide easily into physics, chemistry, biology, engineering, mathematics. There are many interesting questions that really involve all of these and cut across all of these. I mean, one nice example is ice cream, whose texture of ice cream is part physics, part biology, part chemistry. All of this comes in together. So there are. We should look for example that when we teach, we should try to encourage this interdisciplinary thinking across all fields. 
certainly uh, i can't agree more uh, dr ghosh okay uh, very briefly you know, we have really talked a lot for me it's uh, i'd like this stip to look at combining priorities you know which are apparently um, uh, you know on the two diagonals but not really so combining priorities of what we are calling abstract knowledge generation or research and therefore excellence and relevant research relevant meaning market relevant research which can often be blinkered so combining priorities of that basic versus applied because you know what you can see today is not the you know really uh, five years down the lane we don't know what it would be like so combining priorities of pure abstract knowledge generation and research and excellence in that with relevant research that everybody is talking about and you know i research by that i mean the entire ecosystem i also uh, want to bring in uh, the partnership that i talked about a policy that would actually have this public spending of course should have accountability but creating an environment through this policy for enhanced participation so enhanced participation of all stakeholders private sector in r and d industry in r and d uh, you know international agencies r and d so i think enhanced participation it creates that environment and my real um, uh, you know has been one thing that there are various factors that determine the successful implementation of policies so please pay some attention to that that after you write the policy the policy should have inherently some stable commitment and support from uh, you know ch changing alternate governance shared ownership accountability of various implementing agencies blah 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 so how do you evaluate the policies and associate programs and bring that in as a success uh, measure of achieving the stated policy objectives so i'll stop there thank you great thank you dr ghosh and dr jolly pratibha jolly please yeah so i will uh, rather than having an overarching uh, single thing to say i'll link up with three questions where i'd like to add i really like the idea of uh, you know uh, how much of a huge curricular burden school students have and they're not going to use so let me say less is more and today with um, uh, you know you have so much of uh, access to knowledge um, um, digitally and so on so domain knowledge is not what we should focus as much as the process of generating so process of science is where schools should focus uh, largely and they can do that with less curricular material than more of it and burden if that had been done we would not be at such a you know we would not have so much of trauma if exams have been cancelled because those rest on domain knowledge and not on the kind of uh, you know the process by which that knowledge is generated the problem solving skill and creativity which you could be asked questions in any particular context that is one and uh, uh, two also as we spoke about networking and very much that institutions and uh, within geographical radii have to uh, but also i think beyond that uh, uh, they have to uh, network and collaborate it could even be international because at almost zero cost you can have your national our students uh, work together with international students even on credit based courses but that said uh, because i was speaking on vocation and i spoke about uh, you know that you have to have entities outside of the campuses also participating on the other hand you have to have porous borders so that even industry and msmes and so on can come into the institutions and they can use the facilities that are available there uh, have students as assistants so always say if you get a chance to be an assistant to an assistant to an assistant of a researcher take it and i would say that also for industry because you can learn so much and absorb so much on that basis so i think finally to have a ecosystem that is networking all stakeholders learners their families communities and teachers and so on and each one of them is on a personal growth trajectory as a learner i think that is important so teachers have to continue learning students have to continue learning and institutions have to continue learning and each of us needs a capstone project in our life to show what is the learning what is the outcome great great thank you so much everyone i think this was a very insightful discussion and i'm yeah. sure that we uh, in fact uh, despite the paucity of time we did, did try to cover some ground at least i would say 
but I think we have still have miles to go and kind of uh, arrive at it. But I think this discussion has really opened up a lot of things that for us to consider and uh, seriously elaborate and see that how we can embed them in the forthcoming policy. Uh, I think all of them are very useful. With that, I would like to conclude this panel and uh, I take this opportunity to thank each one of you who, who you know, the panelists who gave your valuable insights and uh, sort of brought in volumes of your experience and expertise onto this uh, discussion. I think it wouldn't have been possible without also the enthusiastic participation of our audience and uh, who also asked very relevant questions and hopefully since this is all uh, logged on YouTube and so hopefully this will remain for uh, future uh, archival uses as in and so we will be able to look back and see on that. Uh, on behalf of uh, the Science Policy Forum, Gubi Labs, and the uh, Secretariat at the DST, uh, I like the larger team that has enabled this event. Uh, I think uh, we also have this panel discussion series that are going on, and uh, we have 16 such panels that are there. This is the 10 such panel. Uh, on Monday, we have a panel on data and ethics uh, at the same time between 6 and uh, 8 p.m. in the evening. I would request our audience and all the panelists also to if, uh, convenient make time and participate in that. Uh, with that, I think I would like to come uh, to the conclusion of this. And again, I would like to uh, extend uh, my heartfelt thanks to everyone who made this possible, including the panelists and who are behind the scenes who made this uh, sort of have as technology thing for us in this. Regard. Thank you so much and good night, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.